Mr. Rubini, as, as we agreed before, maybe we'll start with the overview of uh, your views on the future of the labor markets and the education of the world. And if you uh, talk about the connection between your forecasts and your understanding of the current economy and your idea of the uh, changes and transformations of the labor market and the education, which you expressed so brightly in the last articles, uh, we would be extremely grateful. Yeah. Um, first of all, it's a great pleasure and honor being here at this great uh, forum. So it's wonderful being in Moscow here. And uh, usually I speak about what's going on in the short run in the global economy. This morning I have a lecture about what's going on in China, in emerging markets, in Europe, in the United States. And there are, of course, uh, short-term economic problems, including the risk of uh, renewed financial crisis. But I think that uh, an innovation forum like this one should be think also about the medium, long-term future of the global economy and how technology and innovation is going to change the way we live, the way we work, the future of jobs, and so on. And, and I would say that uh, while everybody was a technologist is quite uh, giddy and excited about uh, all the great things that are happening, you know, I often go to Silicon Valley and you talk to these people and you're saying we're on the verge of a cusp of uh, not just information technologies, but also biotechnologies, manufacturing technologies, new financial technology are going to completely change the world, increase productivity and growth. Uh, I think one of the key questions that comes to mind are, are one, what's the future of jobs and of labor, and what's the future of uh, income and wealth inequality? And uh, I think there is a bit in this debate a, a division between those who are more utopian and those who are more dystopian. Uh, the more utopian say, We've had the first uh, industrial revolution, we got the second industrial revolution. Every time a new machine came, uh, people said that's going to displace workers and jobs. And guess what? Uh, the increase in productivity, increase uh, income, increase consumption, new goods and services were created, new jobs were created. So now we're in the third industrial revolution. Uh, similar things are going to happen, so there's nothing to worry about. And then there are those who have a more uh, dystopian view who say that uh, this is very different from the past and there is a threat uh, long term to, to labor, to jobs, to income, and also a sh shift uh, and rise in inequality is going to become quite uh, severe. I mean, some people go as far as saying that uh, robots are going to replace not just jobs but also the human race. Uh, Stephen Hawking, uh, who is uh, the greatest astrophysicist of our time, uh, recently gave a lecture in Cambridge saying that humans should start thinking about colonizing other planets because uh, robots and automation are going to replace not just jobs, but also the human race. So that might be a bit of an extreme view of people who think that singularity might be around the corner. But, uh, but I think it's an important question, the one of what's going to happen. And I think that... Uh, a few things have happened in the last uh, few decades. One is that uh, trade and uh, globalization has led to a significant offshoring uh, of many jobs. Many jobs that were in the United States, uh, in Europe and Japan, they were labor intensive, low value added. Because of trade and globalization have gone now to emerging markets, especially in Asia, China, but also other economies. And these used to be traditionally blue-collar jobs. They were labor-intensive and low-value added. So we don't produce any more T-shirts in the United States. Uh, these are going to China. And even China now doesn't want to produce any more T-shirts, and those are going to Vietnam or Bangladesh and things of that sort. Uh, but um, this offshoring that started in uh, blue-collar jobs that displaced uh, both jobs and incomes uh, in low-value-added, labor-intensive industries and advanced economies uh, is now innovation that also extending to services. Many services now have become uh, tradable. Uh, financial services, call centers, uh, you know, anything to do with technology. And, and now, of course, you know, the jobs that could be done by call center in the United States can be done by call center in Bangalore or in Manila. 
But uh, the key point is that uh, those jobs that are now displaced and offshored to emerging markets, blue collar and white collar, eventually might be replaced by robots, automation, or a piece of software. Uh, so today, maybe a radiologist in India, in Mumbai, can do the same job as a radiologist in New York and reading your x-rays or MRIs, but maybe tomorrow there'll be a piece of software that can do it better and cheaper than any radiologist in New York or Mumbai, and the one in Mumbai is paid uh, one quarter of the salary of the one in New York. Or today, you know, the call centers are, are in Bangalore or in Manila, but often I use the phone and I call my AT&T service center, and rather than a human voice, there is already a machine ask me a question and I have to answer it. Call them Siri types of machines, or, you know, there are movies like her and others that show you what happens when, when machines, a piece of software, can replace also uh, uh, humans. So I think the first stage of this transformation is uh, offshoring of jobs uh, from advanced economies to emerging markets, first uh, blue collar, then white collars. But now there is also another shift that means that uh, many of those jobs are going to be disappearing even from emerging markets. For example, in a place like uh, China today, uh, the iPhones and lots of gadgets, electronics, are being produced uh, by Foxconn, that is a company that has maybe one million workers in China, but wages are rising in China, and Foxconn now is expecting in the next decade to replace those jobs with automation and robots and machines. So, so at least in the US, Europe, and Japan, uh, levels of per capita income are high if stagnating, while China is still a middle-income country, or other countries are not even middle-income. So the question is, uh, what's going to happen to jobs? Uh, what's going to happen to income? Not just uh, blue collars, but also white collars. Not only low-value added jobs, but increasingly technology and software can also replace jobs of traditionally middle-income kind of workers. Uh, there is a recent study by MIT Researchers suggest that up to 50% of all professional categories, most of them uh, uh, white collar, could in the United States in the next few decades be replaced by computers, machines, uh, or robots, and so on. And, and therefore, there's a question of both uh, jobs, of incomes, and then the implications uh, of all these for income and wealth inequality that is being uh, increasing that inequality, in part because of trade and globalization, in part because technology is becoming more capital intensive, skill bias and labor saving, in part because uh, in a world in which your market is not millions of people but billions, those who are at the top, the superstar, have a winner-take-all effect. If you are the best uh, lawyer, the best investment banker, the best trader, the best athlete, the best uh, rock star, the best economist, the best journalist, the best guru, you name it, you get the benefits of a market of billion. So those who are in the top 10, 20% of distribution of skills, who are the top, who are the innovator, get the benefits of that innovation. Everybody else uh, in the pyramid gets less of it. And these effects that are winner take all effects are being exacerbated by technology, externalities, economy of scale come from, from globalization as well. So, so I don't know whether one should be more utopian or more dystopian. I think it's an open debate. There are arguments both ways, but certainly uh, this is a key issue that we have to think about and discuss. Great. Uh, but then, to my mind, something is not um, uh, getting through. Uh, We've had two industrial revolutions already. The, the pure industrial revolution and, and the, the information revolution, the technological revolution lately. The first one um, brought the uh, efficiency of production to the levels thousands times higher than, than before. The one wither started to produce around seven to 8,000 more material per, per, per unit of time than, than, than before the revolution. Still, we, uh, we didn't have armies of jobless people. Uh, children went out of uh, labor. The 14 hours work um, was exchanged to 10 hours work and then later to 8 hours work. Seven days work was exchanged for five days work. 
Uh, and then, um, in, in simpler examples, when you, for example, had the, the printers, the typewriters, and now I have the computers, which are much more efficient. But the number of secretaries didn't change dramatically in the world. The number of secretaries printed the same. Um, do you think the world will still adapt to the changes by allowing people to work in better conditions, uh, fewer hours, uh, fewer days, uh, increasing the, the age of entry and decreasing the age of exit? or uh, the, the resource is exhausted? Uh, well, you know, again, the more utopian view of things uh, was expressed already in the 1930s by John Maynard Keynes. You know, he wrote an essay about uh, what will be the future of his own grandchildren. And even at that time, there was, uh, you know, first, second, last revolution. And, um, and the point he was making was that, well, at that point, the people were working, you know, 60, 70 hours. But he said, once the technological innovation becomes massive, uh, all of us will be able to work less hours, right? He made even an example, everybody working only 10, 15 hours a week and uh, spending the rest of the time, all of us becoming artists and poets or leisure and taking care of our family and friendship and you name it. So that's an ideal world, right? Technology increases productivity. You can produce more goods and services much more cheaply. Uh, we may not need to work as much as before. And as we know, one of the sickness of our society, we're all overworked. Um, and therefore, we can live in a world in which actually we can pursue the things that make actually humans humans, being poets, philosophers, artists, uh, care about uh, the world and things of that sort. Uh, that, that's a utopian world. And of course, you know, uh, people 200 years ago maybe worked 70 hours and then 50 and then 60. The average work week uh, today is 40 hours. And who said that we cannot go back from that to 30 to 20 to 10? And that's the story. And better working conditions and not using children and all the rest. Um, I think that the challenge uh, to that view is the following one. Uh, one of the things is happening right now is that, as I pointed out, uh, technological innovation is increasingly becoming not only capital intensive, but it's also becoming a skill buyers and labor saving. And that means that actually if you are among those who have high human capital, if you are an entrepreneur, if you are an innovator, if you have the kind of skills uh, that cannot be substituted uh, by machines or software or computers, you are in actually quite high demand. Uh, you know, I spend, uh, I spend the last two weeks of my life traveling around the world and working on average uh, 12 hours a day, even during Saturdays and Sundays. I was just uh, all over Asia from Seoul uh, to Tokyo, then went to Washington, I went to NYU for four hours to teach my class, then I rushed to the airport, I came here, and I've been working yesterday and today, and uh, tonight I'm going to take a flight and go to Beijing for the next three days. So those who have the skills and the human capital are in high demand, and actually they work longer and longer hours. I live in New York where a typical investment banker works 100, 120 hours a week. And uh, we could be actually in a world that is the opposite uh, of the one of John Maynard Keynes. It's not a world in which everybody works 15 hours and then we have leisure, but those who have skills that are in high demand, those who are entrepreneurs, those who are innovators, or who are creators are in high demand, and they up, uh, end up working 100 hours a week and maybe be rewarded significantly for their work, while everybody else whose job, uh, whether it's white collar or blue collar, low value added or medium value added, is replaced by machines, is totally dispensable and there is uh, no jobs for them or jobs that are too mediocre to give you uh, a living wage. So the idea was that technology uh, would increase productivity and the benefits of those productivity increases will be spread across the board for everybody. So we all benefit out of that. Uh, but what if technology is capital intensive so those who own financial and real capital get the benefits? Those who are skilled innovators get the benefits and the profits and the rents from that innovation, and everybody else is displaced by machines, robots, automation, and software, and they don't have any jobs. I mean, it might be a, a bit of an extreme caricature. Maybe they have, they have uh, jobs, but they're mediocre jobs that are paid very, very poorly. 
So it might be actually a society in which the problem is not just capital versus labor, but might be between uh, different types of labor. The labor that actually benefits this complementary with technology, because it creates the technology and the capital, and the labor that essentially is substituted by, by technology. That will be a very, very different world from the more utopian ones in which we all have 10 hours a week of work and the rest of the time we can do the beautiful things that make us human. Great. But then I have, I have three questions at once, because there are the three major forces to my mind which will uh, interfere and inter inter interact with the, the process. Uh, let's start with the services part of the equation. There are, there are so many services in the world now which we didn't dream of 100 years ago. Imagine psychotherapists working with every other and maybe every first person in America and every third person in Russia as, as of today. Uh, the, this number is a product of, uh, of the technology, of the ability of, of many people to pay for that and the ability of many people to uh, get away from uh, their working places and become psychotherapists. And babysitters who are now the, the, the ordinary, the, the regular person in the world, and mid-income families have babysitters, and even low-income families have babysitters. They didn't a hundred years ago. And many, many other services which emerged from the Industrial Revolution and now they developed, and, and many more to come. Maybe this is one of the solutions to, to the problem of the imbalance. Um. Uh, it's an interesting and, and valid idea, um, and services, uh, certainly we don't know which are going to be the new jobs of the future that are going to be generated by, by all these technological innovations. But if we look at the cycle that has occurred, let's say, for the last uh, 200 years, of course, 200 years before the first Industrial Revolution, uh, most jobs were uh, you know, in agriculture and primary production. And then uh, as uh, there was massive technological innovation in agriculture, we didn't end all, the, all these jobs. And they went uh, into manufacturing and industry. And then we created lots of manufacturing and industry jobs. And then when the first and the second industrial revolution came, uh, many of those manufacturing jobs uh, disappeared because now you could produce more goods and services with, uh, uh, with less work. And we have got a generation of lots of uh, service jobs. And we became a service economy rather than primary manufacturing. But if you think about uh, what has happened for the last uh, 20, 30 years, uh, one of the important things that has happened was initially services became more tradable. So many of them went to emerging markets. But as I pointed out, uh, uh, many of these uh, service jobs now are also being replaced by uh, technology. I mean, I'll give you a few, you know, a few examples. Uh, you know, it's great that we can all use uh, uh, e-books and on these tablets or iPads, uh, being able to download in one second uh, any book and for ten dollars or whatever. But all the jobs that were in the printing industry and distribution of books, and even the bookstores are gone forever. So it's great for consumers, but tons of jobs have been displaced. Uh, by technology. Uh, think about uh, uh, jobs uh, in transportation. Uh, we know that now there is Uber and lots of services, but we know the future is one of, uh, uh, it's only a matter of time of driverless cars. So all the truck drivers and all the Uber drivers are going to be gone and be gone for good. Uh, we know there is now talk about e-government and there's long bureaucracies that are doing nothing but shuffling paper. Now, luckily, you can go and download uh, lots of government forms online and submit them online rather than staying in line as I used to when I was a kid uh, with a bunch of bureaucrats doing. Those jobs have to be gone uh, forever. Uh, whenever I go to the supermarket now in the United States, uh, at the checkout line, I don't have a clerk anymore. I can just do it on my own. And there were labor-intensive jobs that were those that were restocking the shelves. Uh, with all the foods in the supermarket, but guess what? Now there are robots uh, that are going to be doing it. And all the kind of e-commerce implies that thousands of retail jobs are gone, and luckily I can find those goods and services on Amazon. And for every worker in Amazon, there are probably 10 retail jobs that are being replaced. And, uh, and uh, soon enough, even the, 
uh, the postman who has to deliver my thing might not be necessary there because if uh, Amazon is his own way, drones are going to be delivering for us uh, the goods we are buying from there. Or I'm in the education uh, kind of business. Uh, given online courses, what do we need in the United States? Uh, 10,000 professors of economics. Maybe you take the top 100 of them, you have online courses. Even somebody living in Peoria can take course from Harvard, MIT, Moscow State University, and great universities of the world. And um, thousands of those jobs are going to be gone. Or take the point about healthcare, where, as I said, uh, the job of a radiologist in New York or Mumbai might be replaced by, by software. So, so increasingly, we're seeing a situation in which, uh, even in services, tons of services are being replaced by technology. And it's only a, a matter of time. And people say there'll be all these new services and new jobs and all sorts of other personal services you can provide. You know, some of those personal services are going to be provided also by machines. I mean, I was just recently in Japan where, you know, there is aging of population. You need hundreds of thousands of people to take care of the elderly. For cultural reasons, they don't want to import uh, immigrants from the Philippines or Indonesia. And now they're creating robots, their personal assistant, they're going to take care of the elderly. And people say, well, these guys don't have uh, emotions and so on. Now they recognize your facial expression. When they're sad, they become sad. When you're happy, they become happy. Uh, they're going to become emotionally whatever. So we said that even those personal services cannot be provided eventually by a robot that's going to be your friend. And there's plenty of virtual friends online of one sort uh, uh, or, or the other. And people say, you know, that all these new industries of the future are creating new jobs. Uh, but take, uh, take a few examples in technology. Take, you know, Apple or Amazon or Google or Instagram or Facebook or you name it, or WhatsApp. You know, when WhatsApp was uh, acquired by Facebook for $19 billion, $19 billion was a company with 50 employees. You know, Kodak, that was the photo company of the past, uh, at the peak was employing 150,000 employees. Instagram, that right now does much better than those things, where it was a uh, came out was at 1,000 employees. Facebook uh, three years ago had only 6,000 employees and so on. And as I pointed out, for every job created by Amazon, probably there are 10 retail jobs that are being uh, replaced by computers and machines and, and, and Amazon as well. So we're telling this nice story that uh, there'll be all these great new jobs uh, of personal services that the machine cannot do that are going to be coming out there, it's possible. So far, we have not yet seen it. I mean, it's possible. I'm not saying it's not going to be happening. But I think there are lots of things that are happening right now where the new industries of the future are, are not labor intensive. If you look at the major internet companies around the world, uh, great, successful market caps of hundreds of billions of dollars as, uh, as Google, how many employees does Google have? or I can give you any example around the world. So, so maybe it is the future of those kind of new services requiring human beings rather than machines. We'll see whether those jobs are going to come out and where are they going to be. Okay, then we probably can, can come from another angle. Um, there are still states and the government. And the governments, and at least the leaders of the governments, are being elected by the uh, equal voting. Uh, of the citizens of the, of the greater countries, of the developed countries at least. Then when we move through the, the process and uh, if, we, if we believe the promise of the, uh, the new world with much less jobs, we will have the uh, government selected by uh, unemployed people generally. Then unemployed people will majorly demand the uh, subsidies from the government uh, they will demand the provision of the, the good level of living uh, without contributing of their labor to, uh, to the country. Uh, this is the, uh, the worst different situation from the later 19th century, uh, when the change in the labor productivity happened in the countries where the, uh, the oligarchs, the, the, the big industrial groups, held the powers, and they decided in favor of their efficiency. 
uh, what would be the effect on the governments and on the behavior of the uh, uh, states and even on the democracy? Uh, yeah, that, that's an important and, and difficult question. Um, first of all, I would say, you know, if we do believe that there is a problem, and by the way, you know, if you look at the historical evidence, it may be true that eventually those productivity increases create uh, new industries, new jobs, new incomes, and so on. Uh, but that period of time can be quite long. For example, historians, economic historians, have shown that during the first industrial revolution, uh, real wages actually stagnated for almost uh, 100 years and was only afterwards that eventually we created lots of new goods and services that increase uh, the jobs uh, and the incomes of even working class people. And the transition lasted, uh, you know, almost 100 years. Or, for example, in the United States, median incomes in real terms now have stagnated for 25 years. So, you know, when you didn't have democracy and you were a worker and there was not universal uh, suffrage, tough luck. You know, that adjustment would occur and politically those who were below had to accept those adjustments and there was maybe turmoil, there were strikes, there were revolts, uh, but uh, with some exception those things did not lead to revolution. And, but those who were kind of wise enough uh, among the bourgeois classes realized that either you created a welfare state and you improve the working conditions, the material condition, with education, healthcare, pension, unemployment benefits of the masses, uh, and that was the condition for sustaining liberal uh, capitalism, or otherwise you led revolution. And some countries did it, some countries like Russia did not do it, and you ended up with uh, communists and the Soviet system. So, so I would say that, first of all, if we do believe that these things are going to be disruptive for long periods of time, uh, we have to think about the policy solutions. And there might be enlightened policy solutions. Uh, we have to make sure that we educate our children in a way that makes them be able to compete in this globalized uh, digital economy. Uh, the kind of skills, education you need can be discussed, but maybe there are ways of providing people with the tools uh, that... Uh, they're not going to be displaced by technology and machines and so on. Uh, that's the first solution. The second solution is that if some people are going to be losers for good and their incomes and their jobs are going to be displaced, uh, some degree of uh, progressive taxation that says those who are fortunate enough, because sometimes it's not just a matter of being skilled with more skills or with more intelligence, sometimes it's good luck or bad luck, those who are fortunate enough to have done well uh, will have to be taxed more. Owners of capital and those who are doing better in the distribution of income so that we do either redistribution of income to those who are losers or we give them then education, training and skills to be able to compete and so on. So you have to think about social policies of uh, redistribution that avoid uh, more radical political choices. Some people go as far as saying, you know, uh, our democracies are not going to be working any longer uh, because uh, we'll have a bunch of people that are displaced and they're going to be following policies of redistribution, of taxation, of uh, non-openness to technology, to trade. That's going to actually uh, suffocate the entrepreneurial spirit of those who are innovators and economy will stagnate. And people have these, uh, I believe, delusions of going back to uh, the kind of platonic ideal of democracy where there was a bunch of benevolent uh, wise men or women, in that case was only wise men in ancient Greece, where the philosopher and the statesman who can think about better policies for everybody else. So some people say, you know, democracy is not going to work and we need uh, some form of uh, benevolent autocracy. But I fear that more than a benevolent autocracy in that scenario, we end up into a non-benevolent autocracy. And my example uh, are not just uh, you know, books like 1984 by George Orwell or The Brave New World by Alex Huxley. But if you go and uh, see the movies, the, the Hunger Games, what is The Hunger Games? It's a society in which essentially those who are dispossessed 
where the losers are essentially living in concentration camps, in colonies, and those who instead are the leader are being succeeding because of technology and, uh, and, uh, and innovations are imposing their own dictatorial preference on everybody else. So, so it becomes not a benevolent uh, autocracy a la uh, kind of philosopher states of Plato, but becomes actually one in which you have to use uh, violence and power to keep the masses and the mobs of people are dispossessed under control to make sure that those who are elites uh, are getting their own luxury and their own benefits. So it might not be, uh, those changes politically might not be towards a more benevolent forms of uh, autocracy, but a more malevolent one. And that's, uh, that's the risk that we, we face in the long run, that that will be the, the political outcome of these trends if you don't create a society in which actually you give more opportunity to people. A democracy might die, but it's not going to be uh, a kind of like a, the king philosopher kind of uh, realm. It's going to be a much more ugly one like the Hunger Games. And if you haven't seen those movies, uh, it's worth seeing them. Uh, the, the politics doesn't stop with the borders of one state. We have the whole world with almost 200 states, and the states are vastly different in terms of GDP per capita and the, uh, the wages, and the, uh, the production per person, and, and in other senses. Uh, to what extent the uh, process will uh, differentiate the countries even more? Because we know that uh, when labor is cheap enough, uh, you do not need the innovations in order to produce jobs. You just use labor because it's very cheap. And um, generally, some people say that in ancient Egypt, the pyramids were built by slaves because slaves were cheaper than innovations. And there were no scientists because scientists were more expensive than slaves. Uh, to what extent we can, we can see the world divided into roughly two parts. The innovative part, where uh, people lose their jobs to, to robots, and the part where labor is cheap, and that's why people still work there, and, and robots do not touch the economy of these countries. Um, well, certainly, you know, you can produce um, uh, the same goods and services with uh, more capital and less labor, or with more labor and less capital. And we see that phenomenon throughout the world, uh, you know, uh, some industries uh, in advanced economies where labor costs are high are now fully automatized. Machines are used rather than labor, while similar goods and services in many emerging markets are being uh, still produced by, uh, by more labor-intensive forms of production. Uh, even in more advanced kind of industries, like, you know, uh, look at the automobile sector, I mean, in some of the emerging markets, probably is still production of cars is slightly more uh, labor intensive, while in advanced economies today, already the chassis of the car are totally done by robots. And some of the major car producers are going to say even the assembly is going to eventually in the next 10 to 20 years go into robots doing them rather than humans. And that relative cost of labor versus capital uh, implies that the production uh, composition is different. It's always the case historically. So when there is excessive labor supply relative to capital, labor is cheap, uh, production is more labor intensive when there is uh, not enough labor and there is uh, uh, more capital and labor is expensive, then you use more machines. So uh, th those things have always been around that are going to stay with us for a long period of time. Uh, that's true, but I would say uh, there are a few caveats that are probably, you know, important uh, uh, to think about it. One of them is that even in uh, relatively, how to say, emerging market economies, and I give you the example of China, uh, one, uh, labor costs have become high enough, and the cost of many machines has fallen sharply. I mean, robots used to cost a fortune, and the relative price of actually investment goods is collapsing very sharply, so that even in a place like China, Foxconn says, in the next 10 to 20 years, we can replace a good chunk of these millions of workers with uh, machines and automation. Uh, so in a place like China, the question is, uh, uh, are you going to have a process where technology replaces most jobs even before 
uh, most people become rich, because at least in advanced economies, most people have become rich. That's uh, one factor. Uh, the second factor that is at play is that as long as we have trade and globalization, uh, if automation implies that uh, machines can produce very efficiently certain goods, whether it's in advanced economies or in China, uh, then uh, probably the chances for industrialization and growth of manufacturing in uh, many emerging markets are going to be disappearing. I mean, already in many of these emerging markets, the fact that China is such a dominant force implies that uh, there are challenges to growth of uh, manufacturing and industry and having the industrialization this is a difficult stage of moving away from primary production. So, so many countries are not going to be able to go through that stage because the goods produced by machines are going to be so much cheaper than even labor producing them locally uh, because labor usually is not high productivity if you don't use the, the best technologies. And increasingly probably, as I pointed out, there will be also a number of services that they get traded internationally can be provided also by machines. Uh, tra uh, services are not as tradable, of course, as, uh, as goods, and there'll be a whole range of uh, services that are going to remain uh, uh, non-tradable. So I'm not saying that most jobs are going to be disappearing. We're speaking anyhow to process going to take decades, if not longer. But I think that the question of uh, can poor countries go from poor to middle income, let alone from middle income to higher income and not be trapped in a middle income trap. Uh, those questions are going to become more complicated in a world in which uh, technology produces very cheaply uh, goods and services and those innovators are going to have a comparative advantage to, uh, compared to those who are not. And therefore the opportunities for economic growth and recovery uh, are going to be challenged for those who are behind the curve. I think we, we don't know what's going to be the outcome of it, but uh, there are question marks about something like that as well. Okay, let's, let's go again from, from, from top to, uh, to the bottom and start with the states. When we talk about states who are the, the, um, uh, the winners of the competition, who, who go through the in innovation process and who establish the economy based on innovations and consume less labors and, and produce more technology, what are the, uh, uh, the features of such states? What, what do they do in order to become the uh, successor of the beneficiaries of, of the revolution, as opposed to the countries who are said to be losers? Uh, well, first of all, you have probably to think um, a little bit about uh, what are going to be some of the industries of the future that are going to be important, the new industries as opposed to the traditional one, um, and then uh, identify which countries have the skills to be able to, to be innovators in this uh, in competition. You know, I would say there are at least uh, you know, six new industries of the future. One has to do with, uh, you know, ET, what I call it, energy technologies. Uh, that is not uh, just uh, non-traditional fossil fuels like shale gas and oil, but also green economy, clean tech, stuff having to do with the environment, and so on, solar and whatever not, uh, battery, fuel cells, and so on. Uh, th that's that's one, one aspect of it. Second aspect of it is going to be uh, bio BT, biotechnologies, stem cell research, biomedical research, neuroscience, things are going to make us live uh, longer and healthier. And there is a whole revolution uh, there that's going to go through gene therapy. Uh, third one is uh, information technologies, uh, web 2.0, 3.0, social media, uh, cloud computing, uh, internet of things, and all that stuff that's happening with all the apps. Uh, the fourth one is going to be empty manufacturing technologies, uh, robotic automation, artificial intelligence, nanotechnologies, 3D printing, uh, personalized manufacturing, and you name it. Uh, the fifth one is going to be FT, financial technologies or fintech. There is a revolution also in the provision of financial services, online payment system, cryptocurrencies, uh, peer-to-peer lending. Uh, technology applied to asset management. 
And, and the sixth one is that, unfortunately, in a world in which there are still geopolitical conflicts, there is still demand for weapons, and weapon systems are becoming increasingly high-tech, whether it's drones or application of high-tech system to, to weapon system of one sort or another. So these are at least six, and within them there are many subsectors. So, uh, and then you can ask yourself, uh, take uh, countries like, say, U.S., different parts of uh, Eurozone or Europe, take uh, emerging markets like uh, Brazil, uh, Russia, China, India, to speak about the BRICS, take Korea, take Japan. Uh, ask yourself, uh, in these uh, six industries of the future, which countries seem to have more comparative advantage in how many of them, and so on and so on. I think that's, a, that's an open question. Uh, but I would say that the, the things that probably drive uh, uh, being able to be at the frontier of these things are uh, one having the right type of human capital because these are things that are highly sophisticated that require having uh, how to say enough people that are very good uh, in what people refer as uh, STEM science technology engineering and mathematics those are the kind of things that broadly speaking uh, uh, are necessary so you need to have human capital and the right type of human capital. Uh, you need to have an overall institutional system and business environment that is uh, conducive to have a creative destruction in which uh, you have startup firms, new firms that create all these new innovations as opposed to one that doesn't foster uh, that type of uh, creativity and, and innovation. Uh, and there is an important role that even the the government and the public sector can, uh, can play in fostering, say, basic research that leads to, them to the kind of application that you need and want. Uh, you need uh, usually a dynamic private sector because most of these innovations, with few exceptions, do not occur probably you know, in, the, in the public sector. Uh, so, so you need uh, also the right type of uh, infrastructures. So it's a combination of uh, uh, human capital, uh, investment in physical capital, investment in infrastructure, uh, good institutions, and good uh, technological capital that you have to develop over time that takes you to a place where you want to be. It's a combination of all of these things together that you need them to, to be more successful in, uh, in more of them. Great, and uh, we're essentially coming to the, to the end of the lecture, and the last question should be about the topic of the day, right? We haven't touched it um, uh, really uh, before. When you talk about the human capital, you talk about the education. Generally, there is the, the direct connection between the, the education and the success of people in the world today. We know the, the curves. Uh, but, but, but then, probably, the new qualities of the human capital demand changes in how we, how we teach people. Uh, at least in Russia. We, we, we know that Russia is uh, focused on uh, make, make, making a small piece of Google out of uh, students. Uh, they need to memorize facts, they need to memorize explanations. Um, they are hardly taught to be entrepreneurial, they are hardly taught to be uh, excellent at what they do. Uh, they hardly taught to, to, to think, to challenge, to compare. Um, I, I know less about the American education system, but then pro probably all of them uh, look pretty much alike. What do you think about the changes necessary? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a bit of a complex thing, and I don't have a strong view because there is a debate on what kind of education is necessary uh, for the young people to be able to be uh, compete in this global economy and to be creative and innovative. And by the way, not everybody can be an innovator or an entrepreneur, but you want certainly a larger number of them uh, to be so. And, and actually some, uh, some uh, societies in the past have been able, like in Switzerland or Germany, to be quite successful in vocational training by telling people, you know, we need a X number of mechanics or of these kind of things as opposed to going to college education and providing actually economic opportunity like this, even if we have a creative distraction, entire firms, industries are appearing, disappearing, maybe traditional vocational training may not be as successful as it's been uh, you know, in the past uh, because technology is going to change uh, 
many, many things. But certainly, uh, mechanical learning or memorization is not uh, necessary any longer. You know, anybody who has access to a smartphone as a second brain where, you know, I used to, as a, as a young student, I've been going to, to libraries and look through dusty bins for the right book to find uh, some uh, important statistic or fact or historical event. And right now, all those books are on Google Scholar and any kind of question you can ask uh, on Google or whichever search service can get an instant answer for it. So, so memorization by itself uh, is not critical because uh, the knowledge of stuff that we need to know facts can be found at a click, uh, literally as well. Uh, I think that uh, critical thinking, uh, creative thinking, uh, working uh, with people and not just individually, because a lot of work is now ideas about uh, uh, crowdsourcing and working together as opposed to individually to get the best idea. Uh, a more flexible, liberal education where people can really uh, be open-minded. Uh, you know, nobody's going to have the same job uh, forever in the same company, in the same sector. You'll have to change jobs 10, 20 times in your lifetime. Traditional job category is going to change. So something that is too specialized uh, is not going to be is not going to be sufficient. So it's going to be a digital economy, it's going to be an information economy, it's going to be a knowledge economy, it's going to be a creative economy, it's going to be a more entrepreneurial economy. So you have to have the mental flexibility to be able to resolve different problems and do them in a way that cannot be replaced by, by a machine. Those are going to be the kind of things that give you probably an edge. And of course, in every society, uh, if we're going to have uh, people who can also generally know more about science, more about technology, more about engineering, uh, more about mathematics and things that are having broad application in the technology space, uh, that's going to be important. But sometimes the most creative people are those who come actually uh, from the humanities, knowing how to think, uh, know how to challenge authority, knowing how to be a philosopher, knowing to be an artist, uh, even a liberal arts education that is creative enough can give you that kind of mental flexibility uh, to, 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 to go for the, for the industries of the future. So I don't know we, we, that we have yet the right educational model. It's going to be the right one for everybody. Depends also on your, on your skills and, and opportunities and a lot of thinking has to go. Uh, will we be in a world in which online education can really replace uh, uh, traditional education. Uh, should we think a model in which people spend, uh, you know, 12 uh, years in K-12 education, then four or five years in college and then graduate school, or will we start to, to learn before and work before? You know, in the United States, lots of kids today, uh, uh, you know, don't want even want to college. They want to start their own startup <laughs> because they see Bill Gates who dropped out of uh, Harvard and started Microsoft. They, Think about Mark Zuckerberg, who dropped out of Harvard and created Facebook, and uh, tons of them uh, want to go to Silicon Valley and create the new next startup of the future. Because if they have the right app, the right idea, you could be a billionaire by the age of 24, like this kid who created uh, Snapchat or Instagram and so on. So, so maybe it's a world in which we have to teach uh, kids to start creating stuff while they are already in school and becoming entrepreneurs and start to work when they are in school, rather than thinking about a piece of life, 12 to 16 years, where you study and then you start to work. Because even when you start to work, you'll have to learn and learn again. Uh, education doesn't stop once you finish college or you graduate a degree, but um, being creative doesn't start after you've done uh, primary school, secondary, and after you've done your undergraduate studies and a master, you have to start producing and think and create before. So it'll be a, probably a different model in which uh, uh, you learn throughout your lifetime and you work throughout your lifetime. And that might be a better model than one in which uh, you don't even start having your first job until you are in your, in your 20s. That, um, that might not be the best model for the future. 
Great. Thank you very much. I know that, that you need to hurry up to get to, to a plane because the, the, the roads in, in Russia are not that innovative. You'll spend much time before we leave, and maybe, maybe you give a short and quick answer to the question which I essentially sent to you as the major question here. With all that speech about the innovations and adoptions and, and changes uh, in life and whatever, uh, don't we overestimate the new way for the innovation? What are the evidences that we are really at the verge of the new or the third wave of the Industrial Revolution? Or maybe it's just we, we, we talk about that because we like to talk about the innovations and the situation is not that uh, serious. Well, there are two views. One says, you know, uh, life has not changed very much, you know. We are still driving cars and, you know, there are fancier cars than before. You know, the new versions of new computers uh, don't make us type think uh, faster, but they're the same as before. Lots of these apps and gadgets are not changing anything. So the world has not changed very much. But I think that uh, some of these changes are going to start to become uh, exponential. You know, the Moore's law that applies for computing power could be also applied now to artificial intelligence. I'm not an expert. I talk to some of these people who are experts. Uh, some people say we are uh, 25 uh, years away maximum, about five innovation away from singularity, singularity defined by having thinking autonomous machines. And people say when that happens 25 to 30 years from now, uh, you're going to have uh, thousands of uh, you know, Einsteins that in parallel thinking machines can resolve all the problems of physics, of energy, of uh, lots of stuff that has to do with science. So things are going to be changing very, very fast and, 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 uh, and exponentially. So, so um, it, it, it's, it's hard to tell, but I think things are changing, uh, changing very rapidly. I mean, I'll, I'll give you an example. I, was, I spent a week uh, this summer going to the Galapagos Islands, this beautiful place where Darwin supposedly discovered the theory of uh, evolution uh, by looking at the finches. So I read a couple of books about the theory of evolution. I hadn't done it since I was in high school, so my knowledge of biology was a bit rusty. So it turns out that the planet Earth has been around for four billion years. Uh, there was no life uh, uh, for another half a billion years. So life on uh, this planet has been for 3.5 billion years. For a long time was this monocellular organism. Uh, mammals have been around only for 400 million years. And uh, uh, the human race, uh, in terms of Homo erectus, maybe has been around for 100,000 years, but Homo sapiens has been around for maybe uh, 10,000 years. So first observation, uh, we think that we are at the top of this uh, pyramid. But in the history of 4 billion years of this planet and 3.5 billion years of life, we're totally an appendix at maximum 10,000 years. But you know, in these 10,000 years from uh, the prehistoric case where we're scribbling something, we've created all this new amazing uh, technology that are completely changing the world. And I don't know whether singularity is 25 years away or 30 years away or 40 years away. But you know, in an extreme view of the world, uh, uh, we worry about machine replacing jobs. So what if machines are going to be replacing the human race? You know, we're really a footnote in the history of this uh, planet, let alone in the history of this uh, universe. Maybe things are going to change so much that we are going to be totally obsolete as a human race and uh, deeper and more sophisticated form of life like machine life are going to take us over. That's why Stephen Hawking says we should start thinking about uh, colonizing uh, uh, other planets. Maybe the, it's an extreme view and maybe uh, somehow there'll be a symbiosis between humans and machines in a way that actually everything's going to become much better. But I think many things are changing uh, uh, very, very, very fast. As I said, uh, take uh, the auto industry. It's only a matter of time when uh, the issue is not going to be whether it's going to be driverless car but the issue is going to be, can anybody be allowed uh, to drive a car? 
because uh, once you realize that driving a car by human is so much more risky, terms because 95% of accidents are caused by humans, mistakes, then, um, then you're not going to be allowed to drive a car. The only driverless car, maybe in a closed circuit, you can just, uh, for hobby, <laughs> drive a car old-fashioned way. So we might be on the cusp of stuff that in the next uh, 20, 30 years are going to change the world in more radical ways uh, than the past. And, and certainly for people who are young generation, those kind of technological innovations uh, radically change the world. You know, I used to live in a generation where uh, you know, if you become a doctor, you know, you'll have a good job. If you become a lawyer, if you become an economist, a computer scientist, and so on. But even, even those traditional job categories uh, may be completely disrupted by, uh, by, by technology. So if you are born today, what should you study? What should you specialize? I think uh, it's an open question much more than the past. So in many ways, uh, nothing has changed radically, but probably the next 30, 40 years are going to be very different from the previous 40, 50 years. I think uh, we might be on the cusp of major new disruptive technologies that are going to change the way we live, we work, we interact, and all the rest. You've set a very optimistic note to, to the end of the lecture. Mr. Rubini, thank you very much. The, the time is over, unfortunately for us, uh, not for you. Uh...